Church is like a sprint. Are you ready? We got 60 minutes. I just need a breather right now. I was good. Jen Cousins gave me chocolate covered espresso beans that I loaded up on before this one. So it's going to be a fiery sermon today. Everything's going to light on fire. I don't even care. Like the speaker's on fire, like the lights are on fire. Let's go. Um, you know, a funny thing happened this morning. My daughter, Neela, I got all four of my kids sitting in a row for the first time since church. They serve on like eight t- different teams each. And for the first time ever, they're all sitting in one spot, which is kind of weird. Um, so one of my girls, I'm not going to say which one, was in the kitchen uh, before church. And to try to get, there, she was all by herself. And most of the time there's one or two because we have four kids. So they, you know, they're around the main area, right? And, um, and I walked up to her and I'm like, don't tell the others but I only have one hug and I gave her this big hug. And I feel like that's what God does when we come to worship. He's like, don't tell the others, but here's a big hug. Hey, relax, relax. He's got it. He's God. He's our father in heaven. Um, I'm I'm also very proud of so many of you who've given so generously to the church uh, building. Thank you. People are gonna get their lives delivered there. Listen, children from broken homes are going to come and find that there is healing and there is hope and there is help. Um, Youth are going to come in and and an entire life that maybe you experienced, an entire life is going to be not just avoided the sin, but it's going to be directed into the course of heaven for them. And and God's going to come and change their, their destiny and get them on track because of what we do there. And thank you. All the people who have been helping and building there with me this week. I think I managed to squeeze about 50 or 60 hours the last couple of weeks in there. It's been a busy. You know, Scott and Renee are great, but they left for a week. (laughs) Scott's the building guy. He left, not to take his family on vacation, but he left so that I'd have to talk to drywallers. (laughs) A funny thing happened as I'm uh, preaching a sermon about stubbornness called Not the Donkey. When we're being stubborn, God sends the donkey. He's like, here comes the donkey. And we're like, not the donkey. And he's like, I'm sending the donkey. (laughs) I talked to a stubborn uh, drywaller. Um, So we we had walked through the building. Anybody from the trades world? It's kind of a different world. That's where I grew up in the trades world, the electrical world. Kind of hard hitting, I love it, it's fun. Lots of stuff gets done, but I was, I go into the building. Now this is after my sermon day, which is Tuesday, which is sacred. Like I don't like that sermon. That's what I do. Nobody calls me. My staff knows, but I, I, um, I ended up putting a 12 hour day in at the church building on, on, on sermon day on top of sermon day. Right. And so Wednesday morning, I'm tired. I, I come in there. I'm talking to the, to the, one of the owners of the drywall company with his guy. We walk through all the stuff that needs to be done. These door frames, it's, it's, it's pre-drywall, like door frames and steel stuff and stuff that needs to get framed in there. And we walk through with one of his guys that had been working in the building a little bit. We walk through, we come up with a plan and then the boss leaves and then I'm there and I'm like, okay, so can we just grab this door frame? Cause I gotta go um, <laughs> to my other job. Um, so I'm like, can we just put this in here? I need to drill that anchor that we talked about that's by the water line that you don't want to drill. I know where it is, I'll drill it, you know, whatever. Um, and then, and then he starts like arguing with me. I wish that I had other people's stories for sermon illustrations, but sometimes God gives them to you. And he starts arguing with me. He, he goes, this is not the way I want to do it. And he's, um, he's French Canadian. And if you've never uh, been on a job site with him, they're a passionate bunch. They work hard. They yell a lot. Uh, I love them. Um, but this particular guy was a little bit stubborn, maybe having a bad day. And I'm, I'm like, can you just come over here? Let's just do this thing. I got to go. I, I don't, you know, then you can do whatever it is that you want to do. We had walked through it. He'd already agreed. His boss already told him everything to do. And I'm like, this is part of those things. Let's do this so that I can, you know, keep you moving. Cause we had another drywall crew coming behind him. And I'm like, this has to get done so that we can keep the flow going. And so he starts in arguing, he's like, and he finally, he's like, oh, this is not the way I want to do it. And I'm like, I, okay, what do you want to do? But we got to do this, you know, I'm trying to facilitate this thing. And uh, it was very dramatic and I'm not that way. I don't know why we can't just do our jobs. And 
So anyways, uh, he starts saying like, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. And then he goes, I don't want to fight. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm like, why do we have to go there? You know, he just wanted to take his ball and he starts packing his tools up. I'm like, and then he had to keep telling me, he, he kept, go, kept going into this like, I'm 52 years old and I've been in this trade for 22 years. I'm a professional. Now, one thing I've learned about the trades world, if you got to tell somebody you're a professional a whole bunch of times, the real professionals just do their jobs, right? I can't remember ever telling somebody that I was a professional, particularly the owner of the project. I'm like, that's, you're 52, was that a, bi a big age for you to get to? Was that a landmark? You didn't think you were gonna make it, that's great. I don't care, I just want the door frame in. And then he starts in, it was the funniest thing. He starts in on this argument that's already making no sense to me. I'm like, well, just, so just do your job, you know? Then he starts in this argument, then he goes, then he goes, I believe in God and Jesus too, you know? <laughs> My wife was there. I'm like, like I had started that whole thing with like, hey, whoever doesn't believe in God and Jesus, get your butt over here and do this door frame now. Like you're looking for a camera because it's going to be on TV somewhere and you don't know what's going on. And then he starts telling me like, you're too edgy. Me? You're too edgy. You were edgy when you got here. And Pastor Aaron was there. She's like, that's not edgy him. Like this is like accommodating nice him. Just trying to work with somebody who's having a bad day, you know. So he packs all his stuff up and goes. And as I talk about stubbornness today, that's what we do when we're in stubborn moods. We don't make any sense. We don't want to do something. We just don't want to do it a different way. We just, it's hard to get along with and hard to, so I call this boss up while he's there. I'm like, I'm like, hey, Alex, who's a great guy. I'm like, did you want the mezzanine contract? Because how do you think this works? You know what I mean? Like this is, come on tradespeople. Like, so he sent me a guy that was much easier to get along with. And I realized, Stubborn people are difficult to get along with. And then I asked my mom if I used to be stubborn. <laughs> she said I wasn't. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> Psalm chapter 32. God says to David, hey, write this down for Venue Church. Pastor needs to preach a message. David, write this down. For Venue Church 2021, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. As opposed to you guiding you. He said, I will. That's my job. Now you're your job. And he said, I will advise you and watch over you. But when we're stubborn, we're like, I will guide myself. I will advise myself. I will watch over and protect myself. And God's like, don't do it. And then he says this, and he said, David, you got to get this right for venue church. He said, do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. And you're like, God, I just need people to emotionally connect with me. And he's like, you're stubborn. You need a bit and bridle. So I'm going to preach to the horsey and muley parts of you today. Come on, just lean over to your neighbor and be like, he's talking to you. Just lean over and just be like, hey, he's talking to you right now. Thanks, Sean. I had to warm you up because I am preaching about stubbornness today. I suspect most horses and mules don't know that they're the subject of this passage in scripture. And that part of you, see, I realized about stubbornness. When I'm in a stubborn mood, you know what I say? I'm not being stubborn, I'm right. <laughs> We're gonna talk about it. I'm not stubborn, I'm right. That's why I'm being a tool. That's why I'm digging my heels and that's why. So I thought what I should do, because the horsey and muley parts of us don't know that we're like that because we just think that we're right. So I thought we'll just do a little test here just to see if, if you're stubborn or not. <laughs> Number one, do I reserve final judgment? My boss will tell me something to do. My husband, my mom, my youth leader. Do I reserve final judgment? Like I'll nod and smile and then Pastor's preaching, oh, yeah, oh, I'll look it up. Oh, yeah, it's so good, you guys. It's so good. Number two, do I tend to slow down the trifecta? Slow down, dig my heels in, or become less joyful when I'm asked to do what I don't want to do? Oh, what do you mean? Joyful? No, but they shouldn't ask me to, and God's like, just check it and say yes, and we'll move on. Number three, do I never seem to get around to doing what I'm told? 
I know you want to exercise authority in your home, but where do you give that away? Maybe the reason your teenager doesn't listen to you or respect you is because you don't. Uh, you never seem to get around to, or do you think that you're in charge? God says, I will guide you. I will advise you. I will protect you. Those things belong to me, not to you. He said, if you want to find the best path for your life, you have to stop doing those three things. Stop guiding yourself, advising yourself, and looking out for yourself. I was thinking about the children of Israel, you know, you think about, sometimes we, we make a bigger deal out of Egypt, but see, they had been delivered from Egypt, God sends Moses. And it's funny when I read those, ever since I was a child, you read about Moses and the children of Israel, and how stubborn they were. When I'm reading those passages, do you know who I never am in the story? The children of Israel. I'm always Moses. I'm like, yeah, no, I get it, God. All these people around me. I tell my brother, everybody. No, I get it. I get it. I live with stubborn people. But the funny thing is, <laughs> there weren't that many Moseses and everybody else except for Joshua and Caleb were kind of thrown into the other pile. And uh, it takes an unusual amount of people to make an 11 year journey across the wilderness. That's how long it should have taken. So if they walk slow, give them a month. Some of y'all so slow walk. You didn't grow up with my dad. He's like, come on, let's go. Let's walk. We're going someplace. So it takes us a unique type of a condition in a person's heart to take 40 years and make a 40 year meal out of an 11 day journey. Come on, say amen, venue church. The Bible describes stubborn people as stiff-necked. He just keeps saying, you stiff-necked people. And I was thinking about that. That's good imagery for what we're like when we're in a stubborn mood. Have you, have you ever done a, a nerve in your neck? And then all your muscles freak out and tighten up. And you get these like shooting pains everywhere. And um, I, I, I've done this on occasion in my life. And I had to go into Calgary to pick up some materials one time when we were building our addition uh, in Disbury. And... I was driving in, but I had done my neck and all my, my whole body is just locked up, you know? And um, if you were driving in my blind spot that day, you were in the ditch that day because when I'm changing lanes, I can't turn my head. I can move my eyes. And I realized, you know, when I'm in a stubborn mood, I'm dangerous to the people around me. Also, also, oh, this is gonna preach. Also, I can't see my blind spots. When I'm stubborn and I'm all locked up, I can't rest at night because I'm trying to, un unconsciously, I'm trying to protect my neck, right? Well, the Lord says, I'll protect you. But when you get stubborn and you get locked up, see, your life is supposed to be a facilitation of God's work in the world. But when I'm locked up, I'm like the neck and Jesus said he has the nerve to think that he's the head and ought to be able to tell everything what to do, right? So the head tells the neck, hey, turn. We got to get the eyes looking in our blind spot so we don't hurt somebody. We got to make sure that we can see and we got to work the pedals, right? But when you're stubborn and your neck is stubborn, watch, watch this, watch this. The head, you no longer facilitate the head. You dictate to the head. Now the head has to go wherever you go. Your small group's got to go whichever way. Yeah, precept. Oh, that's so good, pastor. Yeah, no, this is totally me. I get it. Everything has to go, and Jesus can't be the head anymore and tell you what to do and, and guide you and advise you and protect you and get you into the best land for you. He can't do it anymore because you're the one. And that stiff-necked, stubborn thing, you can't rest. You can't, there's no peace because you're always on the lookout, you know? Um, it says in the Bible that, that stubbornness is as idolatry. Remember King Saul, we were, he was insecure, but he was also stubborn. And the word of God says it's as idolatry. Have you ever thought when you're in a stubborn mood, I am worshiping an idol? You're like, that can't be right. Yeah, no, I get it. You're stubborn. You're, you hear the scripture, but you don't. Well, no, not me. No, I'm, I'm right. When King Saul was, and when you are, when you're stubborn, it says it's as idol worship, meaning you put your own mind up higher than God's mind. Think about it. Um, it doesn't say when you're stubborn about 
the wrong things, that it's idolatry. It says when you're stubborn, which means you can be stubborn about the right things and it's still idolatry because this is how I see it in Christians. Am I allowed to preach to Christians today? Christians can be the most stubborn people on earth because you think that God is on your team when you ought to be on God's team. And you will obey God as long as he aligns himself to what you think. But you won't let him align you to what he thinks. Right? So when I'm stubborn, this is how I think. Prove to my satisfaction I should change my mind. Right? Prove to my status. If you can prove to my satisfaction, I will change my mind. Me, me, me. If you can prove to my satisfaction, God's like, but you're not a satisfied person. We preached about this. You're not a satisfied, resilient person. Okay, resilience is springing back in the storm to God's design, God's plan, God's direction, God's protection, right? It's springing back into that place in your life. Stubbornness is like, I'm going to die in this wilderness with the same problems I went into it 40 years ago. Same issues, I'm going to die in this same stubborn-hearted thing. 40 years from now, I'm going to die and not go into the promised land because my issues will never get resolved. And um, prove to my satisfaction that I should change my mind. Do you know who else says that? The devil. Not great to be hanging out in the same company. What do you mean? Well, the devil would, uh, if God could prove to his satisfaction that he should change his mind, the devil would. That is not kingdom. It just makes sense because it's Canadian. Hey, you think that other nations are stubborn. Oh, we're just, we just smile. We're just nice. We just look like, oh yeah, but six months later, come on. I tell, I tell American pastors when they come here to plant a church, I'm like, oh, you won't even know for the first six months what's going on in somebody's head. We smile and nod and we're like, oh, preach it, preach it. And then we talk about you when you're not there. We're just nice about it. Oh, you know, just, here's a prayer concern. When I'm stubborn, listen, also I should talk to you about your mind a little bit. You know, my mind, if you can prove to me that I should change to my mind's satisfaction, what happens when your mind is the problem? Right. And your mind needs regeneration and consecration and setting apart to God. You know, you get saved and your spirit is all great. You, you don't have to train it to connect with God because he rebirths that in you, but your soul is a huge deal, <laughs> a huge problem. And it's made of the flesh and it wants to please the devil in itself. And, and your mind needs to be set apart and consecrated over and over and over again so that it belongs to God. Because it doesn't when you come in, like little bits of it does. But uh, when I'm stubborn, you know what I don't do? I don't admit that I'm wrong. And I'm good at talking, so I'll come up with 50 like ways to make it sound like I'm almost apologizing, <laughs> but not quite get around to it. And then I do things like this, like, well, I'm sorry that you took it like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that you, and you're like, I took it, uh, I took it in the only way that it could be taken when you do hurtful and terrible things. Oh, I'm sorry you took it that way, Jen, because you must be immature to be hurt by the things that, the hurtful things that I do. That's, you're an immature person. That's why you're upset by me being stubborn and a jerk because it's you, <laughs> right? Stubborn people, you just can't admit like, that was me. And then we say like, I'm sorry that I did that. I didn't intend to do that. Have you not figured out that good intentions are for like four year olds, not 40 year olds? Yeah, you kind of intend to do what we do. That's part of the problem. And that's also like, I'm sorry and I meant it. That's why it hurt so much because I meant it when I said it and I shouldn't have. And that's on me and I'm sorry. And I get that it hurt you. Um, yeah, it's good preaching that. But I'll still come up with 50 other ways to say it. You know, Gail, it's because you're immature. That's why it hurt you when I backed into your car out there. Like, why was your car there? It's on you, you know? Um, stubborn people. When I'm stubborn, I don't learn from anything. 40 years in the wilderness. I'll never learn to get over stubbornness. You know what the devil says to us when we're being stubborn and when we're just... If, some, if your family line is stubborn... He'll just be like, you just keep working at it and you just keep going to church and you'll get over it by yourself. Stubborn people are the easiest people to trap because we never ask for help. Do you think that, it, do you honestly think that you could deal with your own stubbornness if you, after all these years, it's been like 20 years or 40 years, you haven't been able to do it yet? 
You need somebody with spiritual authority to get, it's a spirit of stubbornness. It makes us stupid, like stubborn is stupid. It's just, we just become so stupid about everything. And, and you need help. You need, somebody needs to go and get prayed for after. Like you're just going to keep like, oh, just keep, I'll just keep working on my problems myself. And get a divorce in 10 years. You know what I mean? Come on. Like, of course, that's what the devil's going to tell us to do. Just keep working on it. <laughs> God's like, no, you need help, man. You need help. Um, stubborn people, I don't care what the right people think. I'll care what stubborn people think if they happen to agree with me, but not the right people. You need to care what your mom thinks about you. She loves you. She's a voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. And she's like, don't go over there at midnight. That's a really stupid idea. You're like, but I can be trusted. Don't you trust me? And she's like, obviously not. <laughs> Stubbornness, um, I think one of its root causes maybe is this idea of self-righteousness. Remember now, I'm not being stubborn. I'm right. My mom said one time, it always stuck, stuck with me, that when you're self-righteous, you like live in a yard full of rakes with a teeth up. It's like, dang. You can go from being the dumbest person in the world to like five seconds later, like, I could do this on my own. <laughs> you know, I had a, a friend of mine, we got any farmers? I love farmers. You are the most practical bunch in the world. And my, my buddy was a farm kid. He grew up working on the farm. And he saw a rake that had its teeth up in a yard one time. He runs over and turns it over. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you're so stupid. I'm like, well, how bad? I just won't step on it. He's like, so I had to try it, right? For myself. I know what it's going to do. I know it's coming. I still got it right in the forehead. You can be taught it or you can learn it by experience. But the trouble is stubborn people never learn anything. You'll have the same experience for 40 years in the wilderness. You'll never get over it. You're easy to trap because all the devil has to do is add frustration to you. And then you do what you always do and isolate yourself and try to fix it yourself. And then he's got you. You just need help. That's all. Um, when I'm stubborn, I'm resisted by God. He says, God resists the proud. You're going to find it in the story today. You know, my dad's answer to me if I was being stubborn was always no. I could ask for something that he wanted to give me. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody who's praying for something in their life right now. If you're stubborn about it, God can't give it to you because it's like giving your kid a, a, a rake with a bow on it. You'll find a way to step on it and hit yourself in the head. You'll find a way to turn a good thing into a bad thing, into a weapon. It says stubborn spirit. The, the answer has to be no because he resists the proud. If he would give in to a proud person, a stubborn person, would he still be holy? Um, See, see, I can tell, you know, when Pastor Aaron is talking to like young moms about how to structure a family and like, no, no, you don't structure your life around the baby schedule. You structure your life around your family priorities and faith. And then the baby learns to like, oh, this is not around me. And yeah, get a baby to sleep. Like we get it. We have four kids. You know, we used to have lots of parenting ideas. <laughs> then we had kids <laughs> and found out like, oh no, this is different. And so... <laughs> And so when she's trying to talk to a young mom, I see a lot of tendency if, if the mom is stubborn, if the mom is not stubborn, she'll be like, oh, that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing your experience. Well, I don't have to go through the pain that you, but most of the time what we do is, uh, and somebody comes and talks to me about like, hey, how to do things in the church, my authorities, and then I'll spend the rest, the next 20 minutes arguing with them about that I'm already doing it. And they're like, if you're already doing it, why am I talking to you right now? Am I that stupid? You know? You should try to tell somebody, you're like, no, I'm already doing all these things, and I'm already doing all these things. And you'll spend all your, listen, executing time arguing. And, and the devil wants you to be full of words and arguments. Because words are what people substitute for results. And when God speaks and when you have direction from heaven, stop talking. It's just like talking, talking, arguing, 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 arguing. And then after a good argument, you're like, whoo, that was a lot of work. And the devil's like, yeah, you didn't do anything. Perfect. Because he's got arguments and arguments and he'll just keep filling your life up with useless arguments about useless stuff because you're not actually doing anything because you spend all your executing time arguing. And uh, I think that if I would just give in and give up and just be like, yeah, okay, I'll just do that thing. It would take about 10% of the arguing energy and actually get me the result. And then I could be like, that it made no sense, but I guess God is great. You know? God's like, oh, good. You know? um, Numbers chapter 22, it says, Balak. Okay, so there's a king that Israel is finally threatening. <laughs> 
rather than just themselves in the wilderness. They're finally threatening a king called Balak, and it said his messengers, he's, he's like, these people are too many for me. I'm worried that they're going to overtake my land. And he knows that he can't overcome the children of Israel because they're God's people, just like the devil can't overcome you unless he can get you to curse yourself. Watch. And so he, he, he um, who were the elders of Moab and Midian, remember now Abraham and Lot, Lot made some horrible mistakes and had these nations, Moab and Midian, set out with money to pay Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. So Balaam is a prophet, Balak is the king. Ba Balak is like, I can't overcome these people, so can I need somebody to curse them. Um, and so Balaam the prophet, who used to speak for God and kind of others, it, it's a little complicated back then, but he on occasion could speak for God. Um, so Balaam gets these messengers, he says, stay here overnight. In the morning, I'll tell you whatever the Lord directs me to say. So the officials uh, stayed there with Balaam. That night, God came to Balaam and asked him, who are these men visiting you? Now, Balaam does what I, I do when God asks me a loaded question that he might know the answer to. I'm like, oh, you need information. Well, this is why I said that thing to Aaron when I was mad. Because she, and you obviously weren't there because... I had to do it for you. And that's why I said the angry things. And God is just trying to get you to say it. He knows the answer. He's just trying to get... The real question is, who are these men? Why are they in your house? Is this what we do now? We curse people? Why did you give them a place in your house, in your heart? There's something there it's landing on that shouldn't be there. Why are they even here? Are you somebody that can listen to that? Are you somebody that listens to that about other people? Because you think that you ought to uh, flee temptation, not try to resist it. It says resist the devil, flee temptation. Uh, a stubborn person always tries to resist temptation. I know. How do you know? Experience. But God told Balaam, don't go with them. Watch. Do not go with them. Don't. Don't do it. You are not to curse these people. They have been blessed. He's like, they're my people. You're going to curse my people? Don't go with them. Like, why are they even here? The next morning, he got up and told Balak's officials, watch, this is what we do. He says, go on home. And he said, the Lord will not let me go with you. And my boss won't let me do this thing. You don't score points off of God, man. Stop scoring points off your mom. My mom won't let me. You know what he could have said? Like, this is stupid. Do, you, do I look stupid? Why are you here asking me to do this? Do I look that stupid to you? This is dumb. I'm not doing it. You know, curse people. That's not what we do. Um, so the Moabite officials returned to Balak and reported he refused to come with us. So Balak escalates his offer, sends more guys, more dignified. And, and Balaam responded to the next messengers, even if Balak, I love this, were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold. I'm just going to throw this out there. I'll come work for you. I mean, are we talking Disneyland? Is that what? He wants something. He wants something. He said, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. Right there, he's got it. I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. But because I'm stubborn, I'm still going to go against his will. It's my will versus his will. Come on, Jesus in the garden, not my will, but your will. Balaam, not my will, like take me to Disneyland, fill your house with silver, even if you were to give me your palace, like I'm not saying it, but maybe something could get me there. Um, but stay here one more night, oh, oh, and I'll see if the Lord has anything else to say. Listen, here, this is a short and sweet. When God speaks, stop praying and start obeying. Stop talking. If you talk, the devil will trap you. Stop. Why are you praying about something that he told you to obey? Stop it. When mom says, like, clean the dishes, stop talking. It leads to sin. It's what people who don't do anything substitute for doing things. Um, that night, God came to Balaam and said, look, I'm just going to translate this for you. I guess you're going to do it anyways. But in the end, I'm going to get glory in spite of you. That's what that means. 
I don't want to be the kid in God's house that God works in spite of and around rather than working through. God never works because of your stubbornness. He'll get glory in the end in spite of it. Depends which side you want to be on. Do you want to wrestle with God or do you want to have God do the work through you? So the next morning he got up, saddled his donkey and started off with the Moabite officials. You're like, why didn't God stop him? You know? Well, God didn't create robots. Do you want to be a robot? You have a choice, love or hate. Sin, be holy. Go to heaven, go to hell. It's up to you. That's how the world was created, choice. And we turned around and gave it to the devil and the devil broke it. And then we get mad at God and we're like, why did you break the world? And God's like, I gave it to you. You broke it. Give it back to me and I'll heal it. So we got to stop being angry at God as if God broke everything. God's like, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. So quit giving stuff to the devil and being stubborn. That was for free. Watch this. Balaam and his two servants, uh, God sent an angel of the Lord to stand on the road to block, block Balaam's way. Balaam's donkey saw the angel. Your donkey will see it. Your 13 year old teenager that got two brain cells. They'll see it. Oh, I love teenagers. All four of my kids right here. Love you guys. Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into the field. You would too. But Balaam beat it and turned it back under the road. There is something about stubbornness that demands violence. Beware. Beware. If you don't deal with this in your children... They will demand violence against them one day. You can let the Lord break it in your home or you can let them get out there where nobody loves them and have them kneel up in the home. Neela. I love Neela. She had more energy than all the other kids put together probably. Except for maybe Arwen. And when she was little, she'd get mad. She'd pull their hair. And Ayla would be like, oh, dad, my hair is... I'm like, you're twice her size. So I sat them all down on Saturday morning. And this is like a true story. I sat them down. I'm like, if you were boys, I wouldn't have this conversation because it would be all sorted out. I'm like, when she pulls your hair, pull it back. <laughs> and she did, and they did, and the hair pulling stopped. My dad was the same thing. He's like, boy, you got to stop biting your brother. And if you bite, I'm going to bite. And I did, and he did. And then wouldn't you know the biting stopped? It's like, I told you, I'm going to bite your fingers if that's what you want. I'm going to call my dad into social services now. <laughs> hey, the biting stopped. You're welcome. You know, there's something that demands. Okay. Then the angel of the Lord stood at the place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. Just get this mental picture here. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and crush Balaam's foot against the wall. Sometimes you're angry at God for, for your donkey crushing your foot. When it's like, it's better than the alternative. A little pain now is better than what's in the middle of the path. And so, you know, you're like, oh, my life went sideways and oh, everything hurts. And God's like, good, we gotta fix this stubborn thing now before it gets much worse. So Balaam beat the donkey. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord uh, moved further down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get. And then you'll, your life will get choked up and you won't be able to get around it anymore if you miss the first two opportunities and all the other ones that you had. This time when the donkey saw the angel lay down under Balaam in a fit of rage, he beat the animal again with his staff. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. That's always a shock. What have I done to you that deserves your beating me three times? It asked Balaam. You, he yells at the donkey, have made me look like a fool. <laughs> this is like the story of my life right here. Donkey's like, who's screaming at the donkey now? You, you feel like you needed help looking like an idiot? He goes, I'm the same donkey. And the donkey responds, and the donkey is much more logical than Balaam. Um, I'm the same donkey you've ridden all your life. I've been around a long time. He goes, have I ever done this before? No, Balaam said. You just bleed brain cells when you're stubborn. I, I'm telling you. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. He bows his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat your donkey those three times, the angel of the Lord demanded? Like, what are you doing to this poor donkey? <laughs> Look, he said, I've come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. 
Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would have certainly killed the, you by now and spared your donkey. Then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord. Ketz says, I have sinned and I didn't realize because you hadn't proved it to my mental satisfaction. If only you had revealed yourself to me. And he's like, I can't because you're stubborn. I can't do it until it's time for judgment. And he said, uh, I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. But God's like, you're not going. I said, don't go. He said, I will return home and hear the most important words of the sermon. You ready? If you are against my going. Are we still asking if at this stage? Like if. Disneyland is, is it on the table still everything you do in a spirit of uh, in a spirit of stubbornness everything you do that even looks like it's good will be easy for the enemy to undo because it's the wrong spirit we should be a submissive servant mentality kingdom God rules and reigns we are stewards we are here to help. We are here to facilitate the head who is Christ. We, he gets everything he wants. We get nothing if that's what it takes until we want what he wants. And then we just facilitate some more and serve some more. We should be serving our homes, serving our families. Worship prepares us to have stubbornness dealt with in us. But you have to be careful because worship won't prepare you to deal with it if God didn't tell you to deal with it. You'll have enough work to do, but you need somebody to pray for you, I think. You need somebody with spiritual authority over stubbornness because if you've been living with this for 30 years, do you think you have any authority over it? You're an addict. Treat yourself like one. Ask for some help with somebody who's got results, with somebody who's got the power of God to come and pray for you because the devil, isn't that the initial lie that the devil tells stubborn people when I'm stubborn? It's like, just deal with it yourself. And 40 years later, I'm still dealing with it myself because that's not what God wanted. He spoke to me in the Holy Spirit and said, if you want the spirit of stubbornness dealt with in your life, get somebody to pray for you. And not, don't get somebody who's stubborn to pray for you. Get somebody on the prayer team to pray for you. I don't want everything that you do in that stubborn spirit to be undone in your life. And it's time now that we worship. And what worship does, just to prepare our hearts, it's like when I lift my hands, I'm not offering God talent. He's like, yeah, no, I got lots of you. I'm offering, I'm saying not my hand, not these hands, but your hand. Not in my home, not my words, but your words. Not my thoughts, not my emotions. Not anything that's me, but you. Not my plans, but your plans. Not my will, but your will. 